All right, welcome back. This is the third section of chapter seven on light. Um, we're picking up with the nature of materials and how they affect things like absorption and transmission. So there's basically two groups of materials that we look at. Um, so we can classify materials as either opaque or transparent. And this affects their ability to um, either absorb or transmit light. So opaque materials, these are materials that can absorb light um, without re-emitting it. So if you think about examples of uh, materials that don't allow light basically to pass through them, that's what we're talking about as far as opaque materials. So you is you yourself are exactly are an exact example of an opaque material because you can't see through you. That means that light isn't passing through you. You're absorbing that light. Uh, <clears throat> you know, um, tables, chairs, walls, things like that. Anything that you can't see through is going to be an opaque material. Now, what does that mean for them as far as their thermal energy or their heat? Um, this means that whenever they are going to be exposed to a light source, um, that means that their thermal energy or their heat is going to increase uh, because they are going to absorb that energy from that light source. Um, and they have to do something with it. They're generally going to be converting it into heat. Now. Uh, some of that light is going to get reflected off of those objects. Um, now, we'll talk a little bit later in another section about how that creates color, um, because that's actually why objects have color to us, um, because of the light that they don't absorb, the light that they reflect. And then, as you can see here, metals are opaque to light, um, and they're going to reflect that light. Uh, they will absorb some of the energy from it. That's why metals get hot when they are exposed to light energy. Um, but a majority of that is going to get reflected away. Um, that's why metals look shiny to us for the most part. Um, because that shine is actually all of that light being reflected back to our eyes off of that metal material. So if you're not an opaque material, then you're going to be a transparent or translucent material. You may have heard them called translucent materials sometimes. Uh, these are any materials that allow some or all of the frequencies of visible light through. Um, so if you think of some examples, the most common example that we think of uh, for a transparent material is what we see here in the example, and that's glass. Um, but a lot of other things that you would know that are transparent materials, it's basically anything you can see through. So there are a lot of plastics that belong to the transparent material group. Um, water and a lot of other liquids are in the transparent material group uh, because they allow those frequencies of light to pass through them. Now, things like glass are unique in that they allow visible light to pass through, but the other sections of the electromagnetic spectrum are not able to pass through. So you can see in the picture here that ultraviolet um, cannot pass through glass and neither can infrared. And so those sections of the spectrum are actually going to be absorbed by the glass and what will that cause the glass to do? If you think about it, that's energy. That energy is going to get transferred to the glass since it's not going to go through it and that's going to energize those molecules and that's right, it's going to create heat. Um, if you've ever put your hand on a sunny window, um, you know, whether it's winter or summer, that glass is going to feel warmer than you think it should. And that's because these sections of the electromagnetic spectrum are getting transferred and absorbed into that glass. Now, don't freak out. Um, so 
again, just like when I've shown you numbers like this before, I'm not going to ask you to know these numbers, um, but I wanted to show you the uh, speed of light and also the pattern of how the speed of light changes through materials, just like what we saw with the speed of sound. Now, if you remember when we talked about the speed of sound, speed of sound is about 330 meters per second in air. Now, sound couldn't travel through a vacuum because sound needs um, material to vibrate. However, light, because light is, I'm uh, sorry about that, light is an electromagnetic wave. It can travel through a vacuum because it doesn't need material to vibrate. Um, so light can travel through the vacuum. It's actually going to travel the fastest through a vacuum. You can see here at the 300 million meters per second approximately. It's actually something like 299 million and so on, but we're going to go with 300. Um, in the atmosphere, um, it's going to travel at a slightly smaller speed, um, just a little bit less than in a vacuum. Um, now, for the vacuum, you'll see here, it's actually represented by a little c. Um, and so that's what all of these other values are based on. So the atmosphere is a little less than C or a little less than 300 million meters per second, but we basically call it C because it's only a very tiny fraction less um, than what it is in a vacuum. And then when we have light travel from the atmosphere into water, it's actually going to slow down. You can see it's about three quarters of the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, so it's going to slow down. Then when we go into something like glass, so if we go from um, the air or atmosphere into glass, we're going to slow down again. So it's about two thirds the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, depending on the material, that's roughly about what it turns into. And then if we actually have light travel into a diamond, we get down to 0.4. Um, uh, or four tenths the speed of light. So then the question is, why is there a difference? Why do we have this decrease from the vacuum to atmosphere to water to glass to diamond? Well, it actually is related to the same reason why the speed of sound got faster as we went from air to liquid to solid. So let's take a look at how light travels through something like glass. So you have your little electromagnetic photon, your little packet of light energy, and it hits the glass. It's going to hit the first atom in the glass, and that atom is going to swallow up the energy from that photon. Then you can see it's got it and it's going to spit it or burp it out. I love this little graphic. And it's going to shoot to the next atom. And this whole pattern is going to keep occurring. It gets swallowed, it gets burped, it gets swallowed, it gets burped until it gets ejected out the other side of the glass. So this is going to happen all the way across. And as you can imagine, there's probably more than three atoms in that little thickness of glass. So what happens every time we transfer energy? Well, from the energy chapter, we know that every time you transfer energy from one place to the next, you lose some energy. And that's why you get that change in speed as you go from the air to water or water to a solid because when that light energy starts having to move through more and more atoms, you lose more and more energy, and so the light waves slow down. All right, one of the other things that we started off with in our first section for this is that what affects um, the reactions of light is the angle of light. So um, when light hits an object, the angle that it comes in at, whether it's coming in straight on or at an angle, will affect how that light will um, react with the object. So vertical rays um, will be mostly transmitted with a transparent material. So for example, if you have water hitting, or I'm sorry, if you have light hitting water, so for like at 
noon in the middle of the day, if that light is going pretty much straight down, that light is pretty much going to all go straight into the lake, into the water, down to the bottom. However, if you have that same type of light um, at an angle, um, it's going to actually reflect a lot more of the light. So think about if you're out on a lake either early in the morning or late in the afternoon. The sun is much lower in the sky, which means that those sun rays are coming in at a much lower angle. And so they're going to hit the water and some of them will go into the water, but a good amount of them, because that water is fairly flat, are going to hit the water and bounce off. This is what creates glares, which is what you can see here in the picture. Um, this glare is being caused because a lot of that light is coming in at that different angle and bouncing up and into your eyes. This is why we commonly need sunglasses in the earlier parts of the day and later parts of the day when we're out around water. Okay, so at this point I am actually going to I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to have you watch a video by another instructor on refraction because he has some really good animations that I don't have access to on how refraction works. Um, just be aware and I'll put a note on the video as well, you do not need to know how to calculate using Snell's law. He's going to talk about Snell's law. Um, but and show you how to use it, but you do not need to be able to calculate with Snell's Law. You'll see it's got signs um, in it and you're not going to need to have to do any calculations with that. But he's going to talk about refraction in water, which is another reaction, as we saw earlier in another lecture, on how water will react. In this case, when it hits another medium, for example, like you can see here in this uh, diagram, when we go from air to water. So I will turn that over to uh, Dr. Anderson and he'll be able to explain refraction to you with his neat little diagrams.